Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my guest from Canada. Welcome, Robert Clank. Hi, Arnie. I guess we're alone this week, so I hope all will go well. Uh, my brother, Wally, who's usually on, is having a few health problems, so I hope he'll be back next week. Yeah, so do we. We hope so too, Robert, because uh, Wally's contribution um, through his years of exposure to the social credit movement of actually meeting, personally meeting L.D. Byrne, who was an advocate uh, of um, Douglas, Clifford Hugh Douglas, sent to Canada to help the Alberta government. So um, part of history um, is within your family and especially within Wally, part of uh, history, the social credit history. So I actually, each week, I look forward to his contributions. I know that he's um, he's well in years, and uh, he is um, is 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 in, if you like his faculties are at times just marginal. But the thing is, his input is is really valuable, really valuable for the historical record, and uh, and so I'm prepared to always welcome Wally, and I do look forward to hearing good news as to um, as to his health. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to cut across now to our um, to our websites and just work our way through because there is a lot on the plate. There is a lot happening. Um, Cuba is in a state of unrest. They want to throw off the um, communist regime. And of course, Cuba is right on the border of America. So if America was actually a freedom-loving administration, I won't call it the country because the people and their government are not aligned, but if the administration was freedom loving, now would be the time to actually free Cuba. But um, of course they won't. And if anything, they would uh, add, they would work against Cuba freeing itself. And it's quite frustrating. All right, let's go across to our new services. The Australian, a major paper for Australia, talking about an inheritance tax. I think it's very important to recognise that in this age of lockdown, in this age of um, government fiscal policy of just essentially printing money, what they do is they issue a bond each week. In Australia's case, it's between 4 and $5 billion per week. These new government bonds are issued. The central banks pick them up and, of course, buy supposedly buy them. But in actual fact, the central banks just issue money against that bond. And that's the process of it. The central banks create money out of nothing and then issue it as a loan to the federal government, which, of course, is absurd. But that's the nature of the system we're working under. Um, the lockdown is going in Sydney. It's going hard. It looks like it's going to go on right across winter. Don't think that they're going to do the right thing there. And, of course, the um, there is a particular bloke, this bloke here, strategist, advised Andrews to antagonise foes. This is a very important article. I've brought it up. John Armitage has run a, essentially an information or intelligence um, firm that assists the federal, no, assists the Victorian government in their lockdown. And he's on a, um, his, there is, it's a waived competitive tendering rules for him to support the government. So in other words, he just sets a price. The government pays it because he does such a great job. He is constantly polling the Victorian people in order to advise as to the effectiveness of the program of lockdowns and the effectiveness of the, if you like, the public relations manipulation of the of the uh, Victorian people during the lockdown. And this business of this bloke being the leader um, yes, he is, but he is also advised by this firm every step of the way in regard to the uh, manipulation of public opinion. Very, very important to recognise that this is what's actually going on, that the, um, in this case, the Victorian government is constantly monitoring the effectiveness of the campaign, the brainwashing campaign over the population. They live in real time, and this feedback is in real time. Um, financial review, um, big issues in regard to the um, payments now to the Sydney people who are in lockdown. As I said, that looks like it's going to go right across winter. Really threatening situation. Um, financial review again. AMIO, 
AMO is the is to do with the Australian Energy Market Operator. This bloke is the new CEO, and he's saying that he wants 100% renewable energy uh, in the mix for 2025. I think he's delusional. I think that um, he's going to collapse that um, power generation system. He's going to collapse it. We are on the road to becoming a third world nation, and he's one of the leaders of the pack. A third world nation incapable of providing sufficient energy to hold the power grid up. And he's going to go for it. There it is, 100% renewables in four years' time. We're already halfway through 21, so there you go. This is what he's saying. This is his policy. And of course, who's put him in there? A conservative government. Of course it has, because the conservatives, we can trust them, can't we? No, we can't. Um, they're communising Australia just as quickly, just as readily as if they were socialist. The Epoch Times, very important um, Epoch Times is starting to promote a message of homesteading. If they turn the power grid off, if they shut down the water, if they empty the dams. Now we reported a couple of weeks back about California emptying their dams. They're in a five year drought and California is emptying their dams during a five-year drought to expose the Californian people to water restrictions, increased water restrictions. You've got to think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Your governments are actively working against your best interests to cause you to capitulate, to have them as, if you like, the benevolent dictator. Everything comes from them, your water, your food, and, of course, this last area... Um, I'm going to bring up, uh, and this is the Gateway Pundit, very, very important article. 80 central banks around the world are looking at digital currencies. Now, this concept of a digital currency, this is tied in with the world surveillance state. And the digital currency through central banks is so that every issue of credit that you get in this digital currency will be directly tied to you personally. You make a purchase, you think in the old bank card, the old credit card, that that would go through. Yes, it does go through, but it's not completely monitorable. The, um, anyone wants to actually monitor it, then they have to actually get um, legal um, authority, legal justification. They have to justify it. And of course, a, a warrant or a whatever has to be issued in order for them to actually pursue this sort of knowledge. Whereas under the surveillance state, these digital currencies, that information is entirely accessible for people that are interested in monitoring you. Now, I put it to you that the uh, cryptocurrencies, when they first came out, those databases, those databases were an open ledger. Once you made a transaction that was recorded, and that was available for scrutiny. Now, in this case, the central banks were their cryptocurrencies, if you like. This is all private, a private monetary system, private central bank monetary system. They're actually taking the responsibility for managing and issuing the coinage of the land away from the government, and they're handing this responsibility to central banks. And of course, these central banks are answerable to the central bank of central banks. And in the printed currency, if you like, the existing currency, you've got the um, Bank of International Settlements is that central bank of central banks. So we're seeing the building blocks. We're seeing the building blocks of um, energy collapse. We're seeing the World Economic Forum. I believe I brought it up last week. The World Economic Forum is actually testing out the um, uh, supply chain collapses. They're actually doing desktop exercises of supply chain collapses. Now, the World Economic Forum was doing the virus, zoological virus exercises only a couple of months before the COVID scenario. So they're giving us a heads up <clears throat> that the supply chains, the supply chain collapse is imminent. They're giving us a heads up. I noted that I think it was last week in America, an entire supply chain, supermarket supply chain was shut down and the doors were locked because their, their uh, interactive system across the company was hacked. 
and they were being blackmailed. And this is the this is the build up, if you like, the scenario, the build up scenario that these things are actually we can't control it. The hackers are coming from Russia or whatever. And of course, if the hackers are actually affecting Russia, then the hackers must come from America. You've always got this dialectic, and uh, and that's what's being presented to us. This the the if you like the um, real time feedback of polling of public opinion of what the public actually think, and how that can be manipulated. These these group psychologists manipulating the uh, public opinion is a an integral part of the way the federal government works, of the way the state government works. They're constantly polling to find out where the, where the, if you like, the different groupings of people are and what message each group needs to hear in order for them to be nudged across the line into compliance. So it's, um, it is quite sinister. These days are implying a dark future for us. But in it, if you understand what's going on, you can you can actually do some things, some realistic things, and that's where homesteading comes into it. You can actually hold out, you can actually resist the tyranny that's coming towards us. And that is based on one person, one step at a time. Each person having their own sphere of influence, their own local group of no more than a handful, working together to protect them, to protect their interests, and hold out. Because if the supply chains shut down... If the water is turned off, if the power is turned off, then you've got to consider that you are in a siege situation and your government is part of that siege. Your government is actively working against you. That's what I'm saying. I don't believe I'm wrong. I believe I'm reading the writing on the wall. I'm interested in your thoughts and comments, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, I agree with you, Arnie, that the... Authorities that we have long assumed were there to protect our interests are not very reliable these days. I'm sure that an element of them, probably the lower ranks, are, are uh, not working against our interests. But we have had, uh, uh, when was it, last week or the week before, at the legislature in Winnipeg, the capital of Manitoba, a Canadian province, and uh, demonstrators there tore down on Canada Day, our national <laughs> day, the statues of Queen Elizabeth II and Queen Victoria, tore them off their pedestals, threw them to the ground, and then kicked them and painted them and abused them in every way. And the police just looked on. Now, this was a riot. And in fact, only one person got arrested that day, and that was a man who was protesting the destruction of the of the uh, statues. So you have to ask, what is going on? You know, I, I have studied history, and I studied the uh, history of Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution, and the whole country was white anted with uh, revolutionaries. The aristocracy was. Uh, uh, saturated with uh, socialistic ideas. It was the modern way of thinking, they were told. So they got all these people who should have been defending uh, the traditions of the country actually working to overthrow them. And I believe that that's exactly the situation that all the Western countries are in now. This has been being prepared for a long time. I mean, there were, before the Russian Revolution in the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, there were literally thousands of assassinations of uh, bureaucrats in the uh, Tsarist administration. We haven't reached that point yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if I would be surprised if it started at some point. This is just the standard revolutionary pattern, and you have to recognize that these revolutionaries have absolutely no concern for you. They will exploit you. They will exploit your uh, grievances if they can in order to seize power, but they're not doing it for the benefit of the people. They're doing it for the benefit of themselves and the, the people who are financing them, who typically are big bankers. And it's just a, a fact of history. 
it was true in Russia, it was true in uh, France, in the French Revolution. And the same pattern was going on in the French Revolution, too. It was bloody mayhem. Uh, so I have to recognize that uh, these uh, uh, situations we're seeing develop now with the rioting in the streets in the United States and I don't know, the attack on culture, you know, cancel culture everywhere. Well, what is this? This is just a way to deracinate the population. So they are disconnected from their past and uh, all the protections that their past affords them, because there are some very good principles that have been developed in the past, some very good legal and constitutional principles particularly, but they're not being taught to young people anymore. And these revolutionaries are planning to uh, re rework them and put them into a Marxist mold. Mold. All you have to do is look at the Communist Manifesto to see what that involves. Uh, you were talking, Arnie, uh, about an inheritance tax. I don't know if you did it uh, on screen, but you were talking to me about it. And of course, this is part and parcel of the Marxist uh, agenda. They want, and I think the first first point in Marx's ten points was to abolish all rights of inheritance, or it might have been to abolish all private property. But it, they they are uh, two principles that uh, support each other, aren't they? So uh, uh, we see this coming uh, in all directions, and it's really astonishing that people are uh, not objecting to the fact that governments are taking revolutionary uh, positions on all sorts of things. They're, they're asserting an absolute uh, ability to make policy decisions that change practically everything about the country without any uh, uh, input from the population. It's an extraordinary situation, isn't it? And, uh, uh, we have supposedly our uh, parliamentary democracies, and we're supposed to have, you know, the, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. But when Her Majesty's loyal opposition speaks, typically they're saying that the government that is interfering in every area and making uh, these radical changes is not going far enough. That's the criticism that is lodged at them. And it's often lodged at them from supposedly conservative quarters. How can this be? Well, it's because all parties in politics today, all parties that are allowed to exist and the media can destroy you if they, if they don't like the uh, attitude you're taking to any uh, policy, well, they all have the same uh, uh, ideological heritage. It, it, people, people think there are conservatives and liberals. Well, unfortunately, they've all been infiltrated by people who uh, 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 followed uh, the dictates of graduates of the London School of Economics. This institution spread its influence throughout the whole world, not only the Western world, but even the Oriental world and the African world. So uh, that's why you don't have a real debate anymore. You don't have an ide ideological ferment, a, a, a conflict, a, a possibility of uh, discussion of real issues. It's because they're all coming from the same uh, inspiration, which is this Fabian socialism. I'm, uh, alas, it has conquered the world. And it's uh, too bad that more people don't recognize it. Uh, it's, uh, well, if you look into the uh, educational backgrounds of many people in government, particularly in uh, financial portfolios and prime ministers, you will find that they have links back to this uh, socialist ideology that was uh, developed uh, uh, through the London School of Economics, even the libertarians. You know, so many libertarians make a big deal of Ludwig von Mises. There's a Ludwig von Mises Institute. 
supposed to be opposed to uh, the uh, socialist uh, uh, influence in society. Ludwig von Mises was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, the Rockefeller Foundation has financed every revolutionary uh, uh, change in the United States. So it's all of a piece. And uh, uh, if people aren't aware of how this all holds together, they become quite defenseless because they're looking for somebody to come out of the woodwork and save them. But the only people who will be allowed to come out of the woodwork are those who have ideas uh, that are consistent with this socialism that was developed in the London School of Economics. No worries. Thank you for that, Robert. I want to uh, actually cut across to a website and just give people an, a, a bit of a heads up about former Prime Minister of Australia, Bob Hawke. To me, he's a very good example of the ruse that uh, politicians can play. And uh, in his case, he was actually an informant for a foreign power. That has um, reached the front pages of the Australian newspaper, but it was actually first released 19, uh, 2013. 2013, WikiLeaks actually released the information uh, in regard to his uh, working for a foreign power. He was our Prime Minister. He was also the President of the Australian Commercial Trade Unions, and he was uh, obviously an advocate of all things socialist, and yes, he was. But his education actually shows you something, um, that he was he was involved in, in school, University of Western Australia, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws. And then he went on, he won a Rhodes Scholarship to attend Oxford, and Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy, Politics and Economics, and uh, he be under, transferred to a Bachelor of Letters. Now, he was famous for sculling a yard glass. Uh, anyone who knows anything about uh, misspent youth, a yard glass is full of beer. It's supposed to be a yard long, and you scull it, and that's what he did. And he sculled that pot in 11 seconds. So it was a claim to fame of uh, essentially a, um, a bodgy, you know, an ochre. Uh, but in actual fact, what he was was a, a member of the Fabian Socialist Society. His speech, that which you can find... I'll go straight to it, if you like. And uh, you'll find it under PDF Library and under Hawk. Uh, H-I-J-K-L-G-H, under Hawk. Where is it? Addressed to the Fabian Society. And I think that's very important. Um, just recently, um, the eloquence of Robert J. Hawke, um, there was actually a, a study done on him, and this was his involvement with being a an informant for a foreign power. And um, but also, of course, as I just said, his address to the Fabian Society. This was actually issued by the Prime Minister's Department. Um, he he spoke at the centenary dinner, and very interesting speech. Um, why would you? Why would I bring all these things up? Because the history of treachery in Australian politics is no different to any other nation. We think someone may be of a certain ilk and they present a personality of a certain ilk but in actual fact when we do the homework when we actually go and have a look uh, we find that um, in this case this Dinkum Ocker who has a, um, a history of sculling a yard glass was also a Rhodes Scholar and a man of letters and also if you like committing acts of treachery against the Australian people he didn't love Australia as he loved other parties, if you like, other powers that be. He didn't love Australia as his own, and he was our Prime Minister, and he, we were deceived. We were so totally deceived um, when we consider the, the acts that he was actually doing. He was a spy, really, that's what he was. But in the course of that paper, I found that there were many other spies and many other who were loyal to foreign powers, and it was riddled right through our political class. It was riddled. They were climbing over each other to pass this information on because at times in that um, in that article about Hawke, it showed you that the three media giants in Australia actually met at the same time and interviewed Robert J. Hawke as a potential future Prime Minister of Australia. The three media giants. Now, that was an interesting scenario. It was an interesting um, situation to consider because now we're down to two 
media giants. There's Murdoch and there's Fairfax or Channel 9, if you like, 9 News and Entertainment. We only have two media giants and they were interviewing Hawke on the basis of considering him as a future Prime Minister. That's the level of influence that we have over our political class, over our politicians. So when we're trying to consider how do we get, how do we work our way back out of this, we've got to consider that the level of corruption, of permeation within the political process is so, so great. And, uh, and I, think it's to, I think it's very, very important to, for us to actually piece these things together. Now I want to touch on, while I'm here, I want to touch on this inheritance tax because it's um, to me it's important. Front page of the Australian, a study that's been done from a South Australian university, Uni, UniSA, has come up with this report in regard to um, how it is an appropriate time to consider um, inheritance tax. Now, when you are in a position of um, dependence to the benevolent dictator, and that's what we're moving towards with the lockdown, the lunching of the middle class, um, the, um, the, the, the government bonds being bought up by central banks to the tune of four to five thousand million dollars per week. Um, these, these whole apparatus are there to the point where you wouldn't survive if the government wasn't issuing these bonds and the central banks weren't buying them up. Because then the government says that it can't actually have the um, issue, the new loans through payments. It's making payments to Sydney at the moment um, for the lockdown. If the government wasn't issuing those, then where would Sydney be? Sydney would be rioting. Sydney would be rioting. They're going to go through winter on the basis of these payments to try and keep the lid on the building ferment, the building pressure against the government on this lockdown. And that's what it is, is it, it is a building ferment. And so these payments are part of that uh, real-time feedback. They're part of the real-time feedback to, to determine, are we getting away with it? Can we hold this lockdown a little bit longer? Why? Because that's going to force a few more businesses to the wall. That's going to force more indebtedness. It's going to cause people's mortgages to fall in further and further into arrears. And of course, if they don't have a home, if they did have a home, then you've got this issue of inheritance tax coming at you. Who's going to pay that and what are you going to pay that tax with? So the future for our children is being cut off completely. They have absolutely no chance. Half a million, million dollar mortgages and inheritance tax on top of that. So that means that even if their parents pass and want to transfer some sort of legacy onto the children, that will be subject to a tax. Um, so it really is, they're hammering, they're hammering, they're hammering. Every single, from every single angle, they're hammering the middle class. They're hammering any sort of self-reliance and independence. Now, you've, if you consider the likes of the what's going on in America with the calls for Donald Trump, Donald Trump being the perhaps the rightful president, of America. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But I know that the role was reversed under George Bush, where Al Gore may have been the rightful president, but he was uh, beaten, pipped at the post by a sympathetic Bush judge, by a sympathetic Bush governor, who happened to be his brother. And, uh, and so um, George Bush got the presidency, so it's not unprecedented for shenanigans to go on in America. But the thing is, calling for Donald Trump to be reinstated or at least to run for the next presidential election, I think it's very, very important to consider the ramifications of that, the psychological ramifications. And that is that you're going to put all your, if you like, your political faith into one basket. And if Trump isn't that man, then you're going to come up short. Whereas I put it to you that you actually need to consider what's going on locally so that you can affect, have some influence, some say on what is going on locally, on those things that you can actually have some effect on. Um, growing your own food is not a silly option. So collecting your own water is not a silly option. 
setting up alternative power sources are not silly options. These are very realistic considerations because the writing is on the wall. If the if the new CEO of AEMO is really going to lunch our power generation grid by some sort of dream, utopian dream of going all green, which of course they, they're lucky if they cover 2% of power generation, so it's impossible for them to, uh, to achieve a reliable system. If the wind stops, the sun at night time doesn't shine, then you don't have power generation. And that's the, that's the lunacy of what's being proposed. If the water, if you like, the water in the dams is deliberately going to be let out or seized by, if you like, international players in upstream where they are actually not even metered. I was reading that just yesterday, that they're actually taking water out of our main river system and still not putting meters on that water. So we don't even know how much they're taking. And, and the thing is that the... The government bureaucracies are not actually forcing these things into out into the open. So it becomes a whole, where are they actually going right? Because they're deliberately going wrong in so many places. Deliberately going wrong. We've got to consider this very, very carefully in, in the look towards the future, if you like. So I come back to the individual. I come back to the local community. We do actually have to start thinking of the from, a, if you like, an underground. What was the Belgian and French underground doing during occupation? What were they doing? That's how you've got to think. Because your government is not acting in your best interests. They're actually under the control of other powers. And, uh, and so the individual it comes back to, what can you do? What can you do? Now, in our instance, we've done a few things. We've thought ahead. We've been thinking about this scenario for at least... 15 years and I came to a barren block and what was the first thing I did after we terraced the block for the house position was I started planting fruit trees and now we've got a prolific harvest and I know that that's a long-term point of view but you've got to think short-term and long-term and last season virtually all our available ground all the soil we started planting out potatoes and we started planting out green vegetables, leafy vegetables. These are stables for a position of siege. These are stables. These are what your government is really going to get to the point where the supply chains are shut down. The supermarkets are boarded up. The water is turned off. The financial system is going to monitor every single thing that you do. And they're going to do it through the uh, introduction of smart meters remember those smart meters reading everything that goes on in your house and modern appliances with that which actually talk directly to these smart meters you think they these things were done unintentionally they weren't this is part of a long-term strategy they've been putting the building blocks in place for at least the last 50 years in education it started when <laughs> When I was at school, we had our first uh, openly socialist history teacher come into the school and we changed the whole nature of education from one of um, actually going through things, learning them by rote, placing them into an environment where you'd actually, if you like, consider what that meant. You'd had debating teams, you'd actually take issues up and look at it from both points of view. Those things were gone, and that was gone, honestly, in the 60s. 60s, that's like so long ago. <laughs> it really is. That's when it started. That was when the rot started. And it's right through our education systems to the point with critical race theory of, uh, of uh, generational theory, if you like, generational uh, gender theory, if you like, um, gender theory. They're deconstructing the family. They're deconstructing our culture. You think these things are happening unintentionally? Then I put it to you that you're deluded. These things are part of a long-term strategy of revolutionising our, our nations to the point where they can impose a world government. People won't accept that willingly. And so the only way of imposing a world government is to actually deconstruct all the things, the infrastructure, deconstruct the things at work, our constitution, deconstruct 
our method of learning, of teaching, of education, deconstructing our culture where, where we loathe where we've come from, where we actually think the evil things that our predecessors did and so we carry the collective guilt. These are, these are all part of the revolutionary, if you like, rule book. And Marx probably did us a favour in a sense by recording it. I don't know that it was his work, but he was attributed with, with it and recording it. And, and that's why it's very important to take note of these things, because they're the very things, they're the very steps that are being put in place. Communist Manifesto gives you 10 steps to communise a country. Go and read it. See if what's happening isn't exactly according to plan. Interested in your thoughts? Sorry for stealing the floor for so long. Robert Clink. Well, that's a very good uh, suggestion, Arnie. Go read the... Uh, don't read the whole manifesto necessarily. It's a bit long. But just look at the 10 points and compare those points to what exists in our society. And you will find that... I don't know, probably 80% of them have been fully realized already. No, they wanted a central bank and they wanted uh, abolition of inheritance, and abolition of private property and uh, control of education in the hands of the state. It's all been implemented. And uh, through this whole process, people have thought, well, we have this wonderful free market, uh, free enterprise economy. Well, it's been in preparation for a long time to uh, convert it into a socialist top-down economy. Your advice too to people to act at the local level is very important because you have to do what you're capable of doing. And there is absolutely no way that you can influence what's going on at these uh, Bilderberg conferences and uh, uh, you know, the one in Switzerland, what's it? Uh, I forget now, but these people are uh, trying to configure the world in a new way. And our only means of protecting ourselves against it is to get some kind of control over local developments. These we can have an influence on, but uh, the ones that are so remote, we don't even know where the decisions are being made. Uh, we will never influence at all. Um, uh, Marx made a, a, a point of attacking the principle of inheritance. And of course, this is uh, what we're seeing being realized with inheritance tax proposals. Well, I ask, what is the responsibility of every generation in succession? What is it? What's the main responsibility? It has to be to safeguard our inheritance, to make sure that what we transmit to our successors is not deteriorated, is as uh, effective and as uh, productive as the uh, what we inherited from our ancestors. And if we allow this to degrade then we have betrayed future generations. I mean, we should see this. This should be a primary principle of uh, society that it evaluates its uh, uh, assets and it makes sure that what we transmit to our uh, future generations will not be less than what we inherited from our forefathers and indeed should be enhanced because every generation has uh, the capacity to add to the heritage. But there's no looking at society in this way. You know, if things go to hell in a handbasket, if we have a recession or a depression, well, bad luck. But that's, that is that is not a way to look at things. We have to protect the inheritance that we were given and make sure it is transmitted to future generations in at least as good a condition as we received it. So the fact that we don't do this is tragic, if you ask me. Uh, you were talking about uh, your prime minister who turned out to be a spy, Arnie. Well, I, we can match that in Canada. <laughs> 
we had at least two prime ministers who were accused of being uh, spies for uh, the communist uh, international. One of them was Lester Pearson. He was a big internationalist. He was a star in the uh, firmament of uh, the UN. And then there was uh, Pierre Trudeau. And Pierre Trudeau, people don't seem to realize this, but he attended a conference of uh, at least socialists and probably communists in Moscow in 1952. During that conference, he declared he was a communist. Now, he was a total narcissist, so you couldn't really believe what he said. He was always trying to put you off balance. It was a sort of a, uh, a rhetorical trick he played, I guess. But he, he did this with his friends. He did this with everyone he met. He would uh, make outlandish statements, or and then he there might be substance to them. There might not. But he just wanted to get the better of you by make it, putting you in a position where you didn't understand what he was really intending. A very irritating habit. So uh, we had two people like that. And I, I imagine that the current prime minister of Canada, it fits in the same mold, Justin Trudeau, the son of Pierre Trudeau. I mean, he is pursuing Marxist objectives practically, uh, frantically in every aspect to the extent that we have had multiple burning uh, arson attacks on churches in Canada recently. And Trudeau's uh, best friend and chief advisor, a guy named Gerald Butts, characterized these as understandable. They're burning down the churches of the natives, the natives, because apparently the natives have some very severe gr grievance against the church, but they're destroying the natives' churches doing this. And the, and the uh, federal government is taking apparently no steps to uh, find out what is behind these arson attacks and indeed is saying that they seem in some way to be justifiable because of past grievances. This is obviously a revolutionary policy. And uh, we see this from the uh, Trudeau government uh, daily. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an unbelievable uh, phenomenon uh, to see just how radical and uh, subversive all the policies emanating from this man and his cohorts are. Very tragic. Anyway, the principle of inheritance as I was saying, is key to the evolution and the, the development of any society. We have to accept responsibility for passing on to our successors at least what has been passed on to us. But nowadays we have men like Klaus Schwab, this man in the World Economic Forum. And what is his objective? It is that we should have nothing. Well, the way to get us to have nothing is to strip us of our inheritance because our inheritance is what gives us, in effect, everything we have, right? So they're attacking our inheritance in the most aggressive way. And uh, we should be aware of this because uh, they want a situation in which the little people of the world own nothing and people like them, these superior minds like Klaus Schwab, own everything. If people accept this, they really have not any concept of their uh, historical responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, very important. I, I think about <clears throat> what you said then about Klaus Schwab and that. And I think that Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, people of that caliber, are actually owned people rather than their own man, in a sense. I think they're actually doing the bidding of someone else. Um, I don't think that they're actually the, the real seat of power. I think the seat of power is over and above them. 
and uh, and they do it. I mean, who is it? Soros. I mean, where does Soros get his money from? Where does where does he where does Rupert Murdoch get his money from to be the one of the main media moguls of the whole world? I mean, who gives it to him? Because there's no way that the media is sustainable with the collapse of the middle class and advertising. There is no way, Jose, that these things are actually affordable. Um, it's to me it. It makes no financial sense at all, and yet they're held there. And if they're held there, then who's actually doing the holding? Who is doing the holding? Who is actually um, with George Soros, with the Get Up, with the ABC, with the whole left-wing agenda, and with um, Murdoch, the right-wing agenda, Fox News, Fox Sport, Fox everything? Who is actually behind that? It's a good question because it's a it's a philosophical question because it's in the end these people <clears throat> are actually attempting to impose a world dictatorship, and they are, if anything, the um, similar to Joseph with his coat of many colours. He was not the pharaoh, Joseph wasn't. He was the economist. He was the front man doing all the dirty work, but he was actually doing the bidding of of the uh, of the pharaoh behind him. And and so there was this power over and above, and uh, and I think it in its in itself it's quite fascinating. The latest uh, that's come out from our treasurer Josh Feidenberg was in regard to a world tax, and this world tax, of course, is about um, Google, and it's about Facebook and Twitter and Amazon. These giant multinational, cross-national players, these giant players who actually pay very little, if anything, tax at all. And the supposed answer to this, this mega-corporation exploitation of uh, tax advantages to the point where they don't pay tax at all, the supposed answer is to impose a new world tax. A new world tax. Now, Josh Feidenberg is proposing that there be a power above our national government, that there be a power above our nation, where this world tax is subject to scrutiny, subject to transparency, subject to reporting, this world tax. And of course, it's all in the digital currency. When I refer to the 80 central banks, they, they call it a central bank digital currency, CBDC. And it's modelled in some ways, on cryptocurrency. And of course, the algorithms that go with it, su supposedly, in this futuristic, abstract environment of finance for a, for a nation state, and a tax in a world state, a tax for a world state. And I had a look at the framework of what the World Economic Forum is proposing in regard to this world tax, and it is hugely extensive. There are 15, if you like, action items in it. And I've placed the links into the current on target that's actually up on our web. A world tax, a world government, and of course the nation states, if you like, the nation's politicians are ushering in this world government. You can't have a world government without a world tax. I mean, how's the government going to be paid for? And so... The idea of the world government, of course, is based on the surveillance state. Just think, the Chinese surveillance state, I know they call it Chinese social credit. It's a misword. It's a misname. It's not social credit at all. It's social discredit. It's actually the destruction, the distrust in society. So you don't trust society at all. You've got to monitor every single thing that they do. And this is part of the, if you like, the communist world revolution. It's where the nexus of both capital and revolutionary spirit comes together. The nexus. And that's why when you look at the likes of the media modules, you'll see the same dialectic. The nexus of capital and revolutionary spirit coming together in order to impose totalitarianism over the whole world. It really is when you start piecing it together, you start placing your thoughts in that area. Um, you can actually deconstruct it for observation. That's how I learnt. Um, when I was in the oil and gas, when I was in building, I actually had to deconstruct every single component in my mind and to consider it. And then once I understood it, place it back together in the whole 
to see the effect of it. Of course, if you're in a building, if you're in a uh, building a house and you think, well, I'm going to deconstruct how to build one frame to put one door in and one window in and you piece it together with pieces of wood and you actually assemble it, set it up, stand it up, and then you consider all the frames of the house and this is what a house looks like with the timber frames. That's how you understand things. That's how you learn things. And uh, in, a, in the course of that, of course, you... The building codes, this is why inheritance is so important. The building codes is the build-up of knowledge. It's the build-up of experience. It's the build-up of what works best in the construction of a house. The constitutions are also a reflection of that same build-up of learning, of understanding, of seeing the weakness in things, seeing the weakness in human nature. And in Australia, I believe Australia's got the <clears throat> most superior constitution because it's limited. The terms of authority for the federal government are significantly limited to specific tasks only. And those limitations are, if you like, um, answerable to the High Court. And that's what it's about, is, is actually setting it up. This structure is set up. That's our inheritance. That's the, if you like, part of the civics that wouldn't be taught in our schools, but it's a very, very integral part of what we need to understand in order to hold on to what we've got. And so when we see the deconstruction of our culture, the deconstruction of our, if you like, our institutions, of our political mechanisms, we have a national cabinet, unconstitutional, making all these decisions, essentially arbitrary decisions, without parliaments, without debate, without passing laws, these are all the deconstruction of our cultural inheritance. And we've got to look to our cultural inheritance to find the answers, the answers that the ancients of days put in place for us to actually manage these situations. This is not unprecedented, a push for a central government, a push for a world government. Napoleon tried it. The Caesars have tried it. Was it Genghis Khan? Was it whoever? They've tried it before, the push for a world government. You, know, you can attribute perhaps the expansion of Europe in the Second World War before the Second World War was another attempt at placing power in the hands of an individual. Um, too much power. And of course it's, uh, it's at that point where those individuals are no longer answerable and that's what's happening now. The, the actual events that we're seeing unfolding, the lockdown of Sydney, are the politicians held to account? Do we have a mechanism to hold them to account? Do we have a mechanism to remove a public servant like the chief medical officer making these arbitrary computer model decisions, not based on fatalities, not based on good science, demonstrable science at all, but based on political objectives? Do we actually have the mechanisms? This is the type of thinking that we actually need to instill in ourselves. We need to take a step back. We need to look at where we've come from, consider the validity of the scenarios we're seeing through in, in real time. This is our life. This is what it's like. These are the challenges. A hundred years ago, there was the threat and we faced that threat, the First World War. A hundred years ago, we faced that and Australia lost more at Gallipoli in the first six days than almost what we've lost in all of 500 days of COVID. It's about the same. The numbers are very close. In six days of Gallipoli, we lost as many as what we've lost in COVID in 500 days. So it's, it's in our history shows these things that we have overcome these things. We have actually faced significant adversity, but we've got to actually go back to it, to look at it, and we've got to manage it locally. It's always locally. It's always... What can you influence? Well, I can plant a potato. Okay, you can help yourself by planting a potato. You can influence it. I can prune my tree. I can preserve my fruit. I can talk to my neighbour so that if it gets to the stage where there is rioting in the streets, at least with a small community, you can actually make moves to protect yourselves. You can actually do that. Um because this is the this is the scenario, the playing out of the revolution. This is the French Revolution, the Soviet 
Bolshevik Revolution revisited. This is what we're looking at. This is the unfolding in front of us. Don't think it's not. This is what it is. You think, oh, this couldn't be happening to us? It is happening. The dams are being emptied. The power generation is being so thoroughly compromised as to be unreliable and unsustainable. The political mechanisms are such where the bureaucrats, the politicians, are not answerable. The financial system is in such a state that the level of indebtedness means that future generations will be in debt for a hundred years. These are very real things that are happening right now. And while, while all of this is happening, the World Economic Forum is trialling cyber attacks to simulate supply chain collapse. Cyber attacks to simulate supply chain collapse. That means that if a supply chain collapses, the supermarket doors are shuttered. What are you going to do? This is the very thing that we've been saying each and every week, and it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. The message is consistent. You've got to take stock of what you've got. You've got to put things in place. You've got to start thinking and be alert and read what's going on. Read what your government is actually doing. Bob Hawke is not alone. There are plenty out there like him. Your thoughts, please, and closing comments, Robert Clink. Well, <clears throat> I think it's quite a spectacular development that we barely have government by uh, policy or people anymore. Since this COVID business, we have had government based on scientific estimates, scientific projections, nothing real at all. It's all airy fairy nothingness. And yet it's used to justify uh, the stripping of our conventional, our, our well-established freedoms. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to respond to it because it's, it's in, unsubstantial. There's nothing there. They're, they're telling us that they estimate that there will be such and such an effect from the new variants. And because of this, they have to introduce uh, stringent policies to reverse the promises they've made about uh, relaxing the COVID controls. This is going on all over the place now. In Britain, they're hedging their uh, promises all the time. They were supposed to be going off the controls, uh, a, a definite promise uh, by June 23rd. Then they said, no, it's too dangerous. We can't do that. We've got this Delta variant coming in. So we'll put it off for a month. But the promise was that on the 21st of July, the controls would come off. Well, the latest thing coming from the government is they're a little bit worried that this might be premature. So they're just playing us like fish on a hook. It's incredible. And <laughs> there's got to be a limit to people's tolerance for this. It's hard to hard to imagine it because they've taken so much, but uh, it, it simply cannot go on. Uh, another strange aspect of this is that the uh, so-called powers that be uh, have this, well, they've got uh, institutes of behavioral psychology. There's one of these again in Britain, and they quite candidly said at the beginning of the COVID crisis, that they had to intensify the fear in the public. Well, this again, it's, it's not a real thing. It's a psychological dodge, a psychological invention. And yet this is what is being used to uh, set policy and to determine the conditions under which we live. But they uh, <clears throat> seem to, I don't know if it's a kind of, rules of the game they play or whatever, but they seem to allow us opportunities to understand what their plans are. They, they put out this predictive programming. So I don't know if this is their sense of fair play. You don't see much sense of fair play in many respects, but maybe this 
society, whatever it is, Arnie, you said you don't think that Bill Gates and Fauci and so on are the, uh, the uh, basic motivators of the whole thing. I would agree with that. I think it's located more probably in the area of high finance, but uh, maybe there's something even beyond that. How could we possibly know? We're not privy to any of these discussions about what the future of the world is going to be. So uh, anyway, this way they have of putting out predictive programming, I think that an aspect of the psychology they're using is to get us to be participants in our own destruction. This seems to be an element of their uh, strategy. Don't know why they have to do this, but maybe it's more satisfying to have the victim actually uh, participate in his uh, his destruction. It's a, it's a it's a, an odd phenomenon. Uh, Uh, they are going to introduce a world tax, I guess. That's what they're talking about. Well, isn't it strange? They never always talk about adding taxes. Do they ever talk about eliminating taxes? Why can't they do this? If you understand the nature of credit creation, you would realize that money is insubstantial too. It's, it's, it has, it's, it's nothing but figures that somebody is, uh, toting up in a balance sheet or entering into a computer. So there's no limit to the amount of money there can be because it's, it's as I say, just this accountancy. It's not anything real. But we have uh, a lot of monetary reformers or uh, other so-called defenders of free enterprise who insists that we should be going on to a commodity-based money system. Well, this is insanity because what does a commodity such as gold that can be produced in limited quantities have to do with our economic potential and our economic aspirations? It's, it would be a ridiculous limitation on them. So these people are not uh, thinking about the capacity, the potentialities of society, they, they would constrain them by imposing this artificial limitation of a gold standard or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a form of lunacy. We have to recognize that money is just a, an accountancy system that uh, serves the purpose of getting economic activity completed. And the problem with the system we have now is that it is uh, not synchronized. We don't have a distribution of income that reflects the accumulation of prices in our production system. This is the, the Achilles heel of our uh, economy. And until we recognize it and take steps to do something about it, and these steps inevitably will involve a conflict with the money power of the world. It's a big challenge ahead. The only way to uh, uh, fight that power is to create such a uh, wellspring of public opinion against a flawed financial system that distorts everything in our society so that they just can't uh, use their psychological ploys on people anymore to get them to go along with ruinous policies. Um, yeah, I, uh, well, that is the crux of the matter. And it's, it's really unfortunate that we aren't able to get that message over to people more successfully than we have been, but of course, people are preoccupied with the effort merely to survive day by day. And of course, this has been intensified with this COVID thing. People have become increasingly desperate because of it. But at least there's been a demonstration of the fact that if money is lacking, it can be had because all governments have borrowed immense amounts of money. 
They used to say they were strapped for money. Well, suddenly they weren't when COVID came along. So they proved that the uh, um, argument for the limitations imposed on them by money is not true. But they're working in the uh, orthodox conventional financial system, and therefore they're accounting the money that has been made available to allegedly get us through this crisis as debt. There's no necessity for this. There's, it's, it's insanity that it should be passed down future decades in the form of debt that people have to be re repay. It, 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 the debt could be uh, canceled instantaneously. And the only effect as far as the debt held by the financial system, which has created the money out of nothing, the only effect would be, be that they wouldn't have this leverage over society in future. You might want to honor honor people who've got government bonds as individuals and so on. But people who are creating money out of thin air and uh, exerting uh, influence, uh, unimaginable influence over society as a result of this, un this strange privilege they've been accorded, uh, have no entitlement to this uh, power they have to create uh, to create credit. You know, money has a public aspect and it should be uh, administered by governments in a way that is advantageous to the population and burying the world in oceans of debt in perpetuity is hardly beneficial to the population. So this has to be challenged and it would be very nice if our governments would take some steps in that direction, but they won't because they're under the thumb of these financiers. What we have to do is increase the pressure from below from the population so that it will uh, overpower the influence that the uh, financial powers exercise today. Yeah. Yeah. Very good summary, Robert. Very good summary. And I think the key to that, apart from resistance and overcoming, is actually the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth of the actual situation. Is COVID such a very real threat where the entire state or the whole city of Sydney, what is it, 5 million people, has to be locked down virtually indefinitely, or England as a nation locked down? Is it of such a threat, a, an order of magnitude, as as the mor morbidity of it is greater than, if you like, the history of the seasonal flu, because that's all it is. It's no worse than the seasonal flu. The year before COVID, which was 2019, the morbidity for the seasonal flu was greater than last year, last year being the year of COVID. And the st statistics are actually going to be uh, on our on target tomorrow. I'll put it up um, just to show you that um, these projected models by the chief medical officer have not been realised in real life. We've experienced much greater difficulty than COVID, and yet it's out of fear, it's out of confusion. And of course, um, going, back to the, um, going back to the article of these hot, entire industries that are actually organised around manipulating public opinion, and uh, even though this company here only got 1.1 million um, for that uh, year under um, Daniel Andrews' Victorian lockdown, the fact is that, that we are constantly being monitored by these institutions, these public opinion manipulators. We are constantly being monitored in order to nudge public opinion in one way or the other. And right now, of course, there's this push in Australia for vaccine, 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 vaccine. From from whatever age up, it doesn't matter. And for masks, from whatever age down, it doesn't matter. Young babies, I mean, what sort of madness is that? You want their brain to develop. You want as much clean oxygen coming into their lungs as possible. Why would you increase the carbon dioxide intake by putting a mask on a young baby? A form of brutalising. Um, no medical justification, no medical justification to eliminate a virus. A virus is so small that uh, 
it, it honestly it's like trying to stop insects getting through a chain wire fence it's just not going to happen uh, totally ignored the science doesn't add up the chief medical officer's projection of morbidity of course doesn't add up the facts on the ground don't add up your government is doing you great harm and you've got to recognize that and you've got to actually start getting your mind around that perspective um, that they are not there doing a benevolent they are not there benevolent and pursuing someone like donald trump as dictator will offer you no no real answer at all a very tough um crossroads forum today robert i really appreciate your input and i know these things are stark i know these things are hard but I believe every day they're becoming more and more apparent. And if it's our, if you like, it's our um, our duty to report these things and to highlight them so other people can actually take things into account and put things in place to protect themselves. Closing comments, please, Robert. Well, I'll just say, how many times have we been told that these vaccines are safe? And now how many times are we being told that they're keeping their eye on them. Mm. They're seeing what the effects of the injections will be. Yeah. It's such a, a nonsensical situation. Mm. They can allege that they understand everything about them to the extent that they can pronounce them safe. But in the next breath, they're saying, well, we don't really know how long they're going to last. We don't really know how effective they are. We'll give you some sort of a, a percentage but we won't give you any explanation of how we arrived at that percentage. It's just an unending series of no, uh, nonsensical statements. Yeah. And the fact that they are saying that's safe and they're giving this to kids, I mean, it's bad enough to give it to adults. They should be jailed for that. But to be giving this to kids is so abusive and so dangerous that it takes your breath away. Yeah. And, and of course, the COVID itself, the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines are simply under a trial. There is no um, substantiated scientific experiments to justify them. And of course, the emergency legislation was put in place around the world to indemnify the companies uh, trialling these new vaccines. Um, fascinating, fascinating. Another story entirely. But they're safe, Arnie. They're safe. Yeah, <laughs> they have to be indemnified. They don't know what they do, but they're safe. Yeah, I watched a never, video, never. Just, just a closing comment on this, I watched a video the other night, uh, an American, um, he was to do with um, copyright laws and that, an American was actually presenting the case through these copyright laws and, uh, and, um, and no, it wasn't copyright. What's it called? Patents. 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 That's right. Patents. 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 And, and of Dr. Course, Martin, I, do, I forget his first name, but he's yeah. Dr. Martin. That's right. And what a presentation. Yeah. And these, of course, these patents were put in place up 15 years ago. And, and the patents for the virus, which, of course, you're not, you're not by law allowed to patent, but the patents for the virus were put in place. And three days later, the patent for the, if you like, the um, medicine to treat the virus was put in place. If that's not collusion, if that's not planning, I don't know what is. Um, A very, criminal very, conspiracy. Absolutely. And that's what we're looking at. That's what we're looking at. But of course, if the courts are corrupt, if the courts won't actually hold uphold our constitution, if the courts won't uphold our laws and our freedoms, then where do you turn to? How do you do it? And this is where you've got to consider. This is what, this is the revolutionary situation we are up against, and you need to take stock and to put things in place that you can for your local area, your local community, um, to if you like try and face down this siege because that's what it is it's a siege this is only luke's at the crossroads uh, thank you so much robert and thank you ladies and gentlemen thanks only